Do, 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 nobody's here yet. Let's see if people show up. So, let's see. Yay, somebody's here. Huzzah. Three, wow, it just went up 300%. I guess 200%, technically. Uh, bummer. I'll give it a few minutes and then start. <clears throat> so today's actually kind of a fun one. Um, it's another in my series of real talky ones. Your teaching assistant is also here. He's 60 months old. And then I guess I should also get <clears throat> the game that I have for today. Um, I think I'm going to at everyone. And then hopefully that will inspire people to show up. Yeah. No, you can't have my coffee. My coffee is my coffee. No. Oh, do you want the Pikmin again? There we go. Please do not destroy the Pikmin. Um, all right, well, I'm going to get going, and then hopefully more people come online for this but um <clears throat> so welcome to ooh five uh welcome to uh today's lecture uh for games for education <clears throat> so this one has kind of a long title uh which is chocolate covered broccoli finding the fun in transformational games and today we are going to talk about let's talk about this title uh, the phrase chocolate covered broccoli is one that's brought up a lot in transformational games. And the idea is that we're talking about something traditionally boring like educational content and trying to dress it up in something traditionally fun like games. Now, um, I have a friend in the industry who actually says he has tried chocolate covered broccoli and it is not so bad. I'm willing to just take his word for that. I'm not going to test that that uh, theory myself, uh, or I'm not going to test that myself. But it is actually a common, uh, it's, a, it's a known bit of jargon in the game industry, and it's a known bit of jargon in serious or transformational games. So it's, it's a metaphor to be familiar with when working with these kinds of games. Um, and again, you know, I know that this is not, I know I keep saying this, but um, in terms of, and especially since like you all are juniors and seniors, think about this in terms of, like, so we've got a lot of, of former students who, um, you know, they will get jobs and they'll get jobs in, you know, it's not like there are a lot of traditional game companies in the area. There are um, places like Shell Games, and there are uh, some companies up in Cleveland or down in Columbus that are, um, you know, game studios, and some are growing to a degree that they can become more, um, you know, like uh, multivarious games, I would say, is like starting to get to the point where it can be a more traditional employer um, in terms of being a game studio. And uh, now, if if Chris Volp were to see this and be like, Chris, don't do that to me. Um, what? What's the matter? Um, 
he, he closed the door on himself. Um, but, you know, th- they are starting to put out, like, calls for internships and things like that. And, um, you know, yeah. lacking access to, like, again, an EA, an Ubisoft, you know, places like that, you're going to see studios diversify their... Um, what their business model is. So often, and I've said this before, you see studios that are, um, that do some serious game contracting, uh, and contracting in like digital media and VR stuff. Uh, and then they also have like an entertainment wing and then, uh, multivarious would be a studio like that. Um, you know, likewise, uh, I, I have, there's a studio called Little Arm Studio that st- uh, former students of mine founded, same deal they had. Um, they have their, like, serious game stuff that they've done, and that's, like, their primary money maker. and then they like to make, you know, commercial games um, as, you know, sort of their aspirational things. And even companies like WayForward do the same thing. Now, um... You know, and on the flip side, again, going back to students who've gotten jobs at different places, we have students that get jobs at places that are doing mainly like client driven AR or VR, uh, AR being augmented reality. And that often can be um, serious games content. Now, that also gives that student the ability, like maybe that's that company's central. Thing, but then that also gives the student the ability to make, you know, commercial style games on the side. So all of this is to say is that like, you know, keep this in mind as part of this ecosystem. Um, but one of the things that you have the benefit of is that you're studying game development of this kind so that you can see like the nuance that happens to make sure that you're making something fun. And we talked about that a lot last week when I talked about my own experiences uh, working with clients and managing some of the, you know, client goals versus the gameplay goals. Um, And that's what a lot of this is going to be about is, uh, you know, you want to be familiar with how to strike that balance. And again, in case you can't notice, this is something that I'm really big on in transformational games simply because it is a tightrope um and it is a thing it is an area where i've seen a lot of transformational game studios falter so topics for today gamification uh so that's this is the big one which is gamification um you know and we'll talk about that i i i who can tell how i feel about gamification um please reply in the chat But we are going to talk about gamification and game psychology, and this is actually useful because, and I I have to do a final confirmation with her, but during your class, during the 11 to 12 time frame on Wednesday, um, you know, we are uh, in Blackboard Ultra, or in Collaborate Ultra on Blackboard, we are going to have a guest speaker, uh, Dr. Kelly Dunlap. Uh, who is a psychologist and a game developer, uh, and I've collaborated with her on some stuff. Um, but she's super awesome. Uh, she used to own a Halo team. Um, and so my mental model of like owning an eSports team is like you're an NFL owner, and that's apparently not the case at all, or at least not the case for like a lot of games. You know, not talking about like the Cavs having a esports team or something like that but um yeah she had a halo team uh for a great many years and was a competitive gamer as well so um you know she's going to come in and then we're also going to talk about um game design patterns uh with an exercise from a friend of mine chris barney um and he talks about game design patterns for avoid or uh game design patterns we'll talk about what those are and then also talk about Patterns for avoiding specifically gamification. Um, so, gamification. Let's talk about... So when people are talking about chocolate-covered broccoli, they're talking about gamification. And what is that? Well, it's using game reward systems for non-game activities. This is the nice definition. Uh 
Um, over the last 10 years, gamification has been the topic of books on how to employ it in education, training, business, sales, and other applications. Um, so even, even a, uh, you know, noteworthy game developer like Jane McGonigal, who's like a good game designer, um, writes a lot about things that would basically come down to gamification. So, you know, and again, these are where re uh, reward systems are applied to non-playful activities like buying products or schoolwork or using a business's website or other things that a company might want you to do. What are you playing with? Oh, should I let you have that? I don't know if I should let you have that. Um, so, you know, um, boo, 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 enjoy the cartoon. So you might hear things like this, badging. Um, so if you, here's some things that like appear as gamification. Um, so you encounter this anytime you encounter a system that offers you things like points, levels, achievements, uh, or badges for uh, accomplishing real world tasks. So the educational management platform Blackboard, for example, and if we were on Blackboard Ultra, I would be all like, Blackboard, um, but we're not, we're on YouTube. But even like, <clears throat> I guess YouTube kind of has incentives for, I mean, some of these platforms have these incentives for engaging in them though too, right? Like um, certain forums, like bulletin board forums have uh you know um you know points and levels and things like that for posting on the forums a lot and so you know this is not a new system that's right i should not let you have this can i have that please thank you um he was playing with a plug for an iphone so um the, the uh, Blackboard has an optional badging system that teachers can use to incentivize students to engage with the class's page. I don't use it. I, no. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. Um, are there any questions about this, by the way? Like, because, you know, this is something that I think I want to hear. Like, have you encountered gamification in any particular way? Um, and if so, what did you think about it? Let me know in the in the chat. Um, I'm really interested in hearing your perspective on it because, again, this is something that's almost become routine in a way. And, you know, but it's also still kind of a hot commodity. Like I've been within the last few years, the, the client didn't wasn't able to really get itself together to get production into this going but like I've been basically I've been hired to do gamification systems before um and you know so it's not to say don't do it I mean if somebody's going to pay you enough money yay um but when given the ability to it's not a type of game development that I I personally like being involved in when I think of gamification is I always thought of before uh, when I heard of an educational game. Yeah. Um, well, and again, this is so this that's a great point. Somebody makes in chat. Um, gamification is what they think of when they think of an educational game. This is. Yeah, that's kind of it, is that um, this is where that chocolate covered broccoli aspect comes in, because when you um, this is what you get when you like don't get a lot of money to make an educational game. And, you know, I am from the generation that I grew up with, like a lot of really good um, educational games, like really good engaging educational games. And that is, um, that's because they had budgets. You know, the Oregon Trail had budgets. The Math Blaster had budgets. Um, and, you know, having a good budget allows you to actually have more time to go through the actual practice of game development uh, that you would in a more commercial style studio. Whereas if they're doing something real quickly, ooh, don't play with that. I should not 
let you have access to this print of the cover of The Hobbit. Um, anyway, uh, so somebody asked, uh, does Duolingo, uh, Duolingo count as gamified? Dear Lord, yes. Um, it's kind of egregious. And with Duolingo, Duolingo bleh, you get the other aspect of it, where is you almost get the like Farmville experience or like, you know, mobile game experience where, um, you know, I think Duolingo balances it well enough where you can go for a while and get your like, you know, 10, 15 minutes of Spanish in where, um, you know, yeah. without like being kind of unable to proceed. But there is definitely a version where it's like, you know, it'll give you points for watching an ad or points for, you know, doing stuff with the advertising and the funding of the thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the flip side, you have like, if you want unlimited goes at something, then you have to like buy into the Duolingo subscription. And, you know, so there's a, excuse me, he wants to leave. Um, there is like the Farmville thing there or the, the Candy Crush thing where it's like, if you want to make it easier and less obtrusive, you will uh, spend real world money to, to go in um, and get the like all access pass. So that adds like another whole level to it where like, let's say I instituted a system where you would get points for doing readings or like logging that you did the readings on Blackboard or something like that. That would involve a lot of a trust system. Um, but the, uh, not that I don't trust you, but you know, like how can you verify that really um, with a check-in system? The, like that would be me applying that um, so that's like one level of it is that you get points for doing the class content. Um, what Duolingo is doing with the advertisers and the subscription model is like, it's gamification, but taken to the point of, again, like Candy Crush, which again, like, I think it's balanced well, but it's still there. Uh, anyway, so real quick, uh, and examples of gamification include the website and app Super Better by Jane McGonigal. Uh, players complete quests that are actually real life wellness tasks, then log them into the site for points. Um, and like I mentioned to, hey, look, <laughs> um, Duolingo. So, you know, does it count as gamified? Look at this. I forget. So um, I made these slides last year. So if I forget that I make a certain. Um, citation that's what's going on when i'm like oh hey look the thing we were talking about um so players are given points for taking language lessons and awarded bonuses for using the app for multiple days i predict the future yes you do thank you cheers um so yeah but you know again that's like another that's like another level um and there is but even like think about how we talked about how Duolingo works is that it it's balanced such that you can still get in that lesson and you never actually have to to um, you know cross that level of like paying the real money. The downside and like really the advertising, how hard is it to you know. Um, you hit the ad, you get your points, and then you have 30 seconds to go make a sandwich or something. Um, I, I really feel like it balances well, though. And that's the other thing you have to really think about is, like, how is this balanced? Because Candy Crush is kind of, like, balanced against you unless you pay money. And, you know, the people that, like, I have friends who have beaten Candy Crush and it's just because of like sheer stubbornness, they might have to play a level a bunch of times, but they do it without paying money. Um, so you almost do it in spite of itself. And then if you think back to something like Farmville, you can really only do like three things a day 
unless you pay into it. Um, otherwise, you're just like, okay, I've I've planted my corn. I, I logged onto this game app to make one click. You know, so there's game balancing that goes into this is is how overbearing your system is um so it's like what's level one is like what systems exist for this and then level two is like how overbearing um again farmville candy crush that's all like they're trying to make money off of you gamification is trying to educate you um so it's like bad systems tuned down so other more subtle examples include reward programs created by companies for using their products and even recruiting tools for the military. Um, so as game designers see it though, gamification is badly implemented game design. And so this is like, this is the definition. This is like the judgmental definition, but it's also the definition I kind of buy into. Um, in another slide from uh, a Mark Chen, uh, from the Mark Chen um, presentation on gamification, he talks about how practitioners of gamification often forget the whole experience of why games are fun and concentrate on only what an outside observer might think about why games are fun. So, you know, applying these mechanisms carelessly is like indiscriminately pouring chocolate on different things rather than finding foods that the chocolate pairs well with. Um, it could result in, at best, the boring part is still boring. At worst, the um, you know whole thing can be like super icky. So one of my teachers from, uh, not, from school wanted to make a game that incentivized certain behavior in a class. It sounds like a lot of fun, but he was not done working on it at the time. Is this also gamification? Uh, yes. So I have done, I've read a book um, called The Multiplayer Classroom by Lee Sheldon. And Lee Sheldon is like a super cool guy. Um, and this book is like actually pretty good, um, but it talks about turning your class into a role-playing game system. And the idea is that the students all start with zero points and you build up to an A. So like if th this were that class, um, you'd all have zero points at the beginning of the semester and then you'd have to like achieve amounts of points to get different grades. And so it's almost like a super transparent version of like, how do you, um, like what grade do you want, right? Like if you want an A so bad, you, get, you earn the A. Um, which sounds super scary when I phrase it like that. So, um, you know, the way that the class works is that you do a, like, so you're working on games right now. And let's say it's one of you on your team. I actually have done this syllabus. Um, I, it actually works in a certain way. Um, so like, let's say you're making a game and you're the artist on the team. You, maybe I give you like 10 points for every sprite you make for your game. So you're just gonna like sit there in a sprite cranking or Piscal or whatever, cranking out sprites, right? Um, and you've like, you kind of grind your way up to the A. Um, so that's chocolate onions. Yes, chocolate onions. Um, so that is gamification. And I've done that in classes before, and I can tell you from experience that it actually is highly successful in, so it's successful in two ways. It's great for classes where you're doing a big project because it gives you students a like ex uh, explicit to-do list, um, but it also is like very good for inspiring productivity because you're like kind of grinding out stuff. Now, Here's the question, you know, here's, here's a story though about it. Um, I had that when I was working at George Mason and it did all the things I just said it did. Great productivity, great projects coming out of it. Um, then I moved to another university, uh, American university, and I started using this in other classes. Um, and I, you know, I, I'd use it for all my classes at Mason, 
but so I started using it for classes there and they hate the students hated it. And what it was is that it was, you know, this was a really important um, lesson of game. Like I, I didn't like gamification in a very abstract way. Like, you know, Ooh, gamification um, from like an academic perspective, but in practice using some of it and being like, well, if I use just a little, it won't hurt anything. Here's how it hurt things. Students it, using the reward system and making people grind for stuff is not the fun part of games. Why are games like, like you tell me, shout out in the, in the chat, people who are on chat, like what are some things you like about games? What are some things that you think makes games fun? And I'm going to give you a hint as to where it went. What is it about games that make you want to try again and make you motivated to try again or feel that you're able to try again? If anybody's wondering, this is my Kent State mug. So, um, so somebody says in relation to sandbox games, I can do literally whatever I want in them with no real world consequence. Having multiple ah, oh, you all are nailing it. Yes, um, yes, no real world consequence, multiple tries and multiple attempts. That's it. That's the thing. And so, exactly, I'm standing in the middle of this class, and I, I, I go to this talk, and it actually is the talk that, like, inspired me to make the grading system that I currently use. And I'm not saying it's perfect and, or that it is the best at this, at motivating these multiple tries, but I remember I walked into, I made this switch in the middle of my 3D class, actually, in, the, like, the middle of the semester, and I can tell all of the students were, uh, to give you an idea of the demographic of the um, the students I had at AU, it was a graduate course, it was a graduate school or a graduate program. Um, so you're talking like two years instead of four years. And a lot of the students were not, I would say, like, the, the program was marketed to non-traditional gaming students so people that were like not gamers it was a lot of um people that were working for not dc nonprofit type companies or or organizations and then they would come to learn game design to be able to adapt concepts from game development into their organization's work um so if i'm ever you know it when I teach this class, like how I am kind of boosting, like, hey, don't forget to play games. Don't forget to, you know, like it's your job to learn about the field, things like that. Um, you know, even though I would say the demographic of this particular, uh, in, you know, this program, this school is one where like all, most of you seem to have a more traditional I, I can't, shouldn't even call it traditional, but like, you know, a more robust gaming experience. And you kind of like went from, oh, I like games to maybe I want to study game development, um, you know, which is very typical. Um, that's where a lot of that buttressing comes in is because like I had that background. This is all a way to say that, you know, that non-background plus... Um, two years made it like very truncated in terms of things like learning 3D. So we didn't have like a ton of curricular space for 3D. So, you know, imagine your classes as you have them now. Uh, we had to like squeeze that into, you know, most people took a semester of 3D, if at all. So, you know, it's, it's very short. Um, so like there was, there was a lot of significant stress about learning it. And the sort of traditional 
RPG grindy model worked really well for one group at one school, went to a different school, freaked everybody out, and they're freaking out about learning 3D, when really it's supposed to be a point system that gets you trying again because you're making lots of stuff. So what I did is I got up at the beginning of the class. I like basically rewrote the whole grading system. Got up at the beginning of class. I said, all right, here's what we're going to do. And then I described the grading system, which is like, you know, you're gonna same thing as now. You have a list of like, if you're this person in December, you're going to be able to get an A. If you have this list of skills in December, you'll get a B, things like that. So it's still choose your own grade level, but it's choose your own grade level, um, but everything is graded for completion. So you're not being graded on perfection. You're kind of taught to like, you you know, it's not like the sort of one and done, you're, do you get all the points or not kind of thing. And again, like you have, um, so I, I say like, all right, what, that's a possibility to switch to. What do you all think? And like, the answer was just the entire class going, oh. so I was like, oh, so you like it then. Cool. Um, and the idea again is like that they had, they could just like have multiple attempts um, rather than like, again, grading, oh, you made a crate, but it's a crappy crate, boo, you know, like a week into them making a, a 3D thing at all. So um, the point of that is that it it embraced multiple tries or the possibility of multiple tries and practicing. It took the, the stress off of the achievement of individual things and became more like, okay, you're graded for everything. Um, if you do everything like by the book, you're going to get, I think it was like a B minus or a C because it was grad school. Um, you know, you'll get these points and then you're awarded like points for really pushing yourself and striving and, you know, like you are. Um, and, you know, they embraced the multiple attempts. Like the idea of making something that, wasn't up to snuff at the beginning when they were still learning was gone and now they could feel like they could you know do more um so you know that transformation made it that actually made it feel like a game you know instead of like a reward system so i'm being hard on gamification but i should note that there are examples that genuinely help people jane mcgonigal's gamification systems are popular for some members of their audience uh reward systems are enough to have genuine results. So gamification, like, I don't personally like it. I don't like to make it. I'll make it if somebody pays me enough. Um, but, and like, I would advise you to do the same. Um, but, you know, there are, there are people who genuinely are helped by that. Um, so again, Jane McGonagall systems are popular for that very reason. Uh, other systems include things like, if you remember We Fit. Uh, like, I lost weight on Wii Fit when it came out, and and I'm a person who like who likes to exercise regularly, um, anyway. But having a little thing with my amiibo or amiibo with my me going like woo, um, was just like an extra little push, which was nice. So you know, as with many things in transformational games, the success of your work depends on the research you've done into your audience and into the types of platforms. So, you know, there might be a version of this where gamification is the answer. So, you know, if you study a group of people and you see that they have a high correlation of playing mobile apps uh, or, you know, like everybody that, you know, in the like group of people you're trying to help also happens to like, play Candy Crush or whatever is like the new hot mobile game, you can probably bet that they'd gravitate to a game like their favorite mobile game, even if it has some like things that from a game design perspective are a little icky. You can make the non-icky version of those and, and get something out of and they can get something out of it. So let's look at the psychology of games again. Uh, so if you recall, are there any questions or, or Kind of because we're switching um, topic here. Are there any questions or, or comments on this?
I'm gonna let the chat catch up while I check something. All right. Um, well, if you have any comments, um, you know, I'll answer them in the chat, but I'm going to keep moving on. So, you know, we looked at three different teaching paradigms present in games in our in our uh, previous lecture, um, behavior theory, Montessori and constructivism. So one of the main criticisms of gamification is that they boil down to what's called a Skinner box. Uh, so a Skinner box was a it, it's a box uh, used to understand behavior theory by um, psychoanalyst B.F. Skinner. That's why it's called the Skinner box. And basically, you have a uh, rat in a cage, despite all his rage. Um, that's a old cut for you kids that are younger than me. Um, so he's a rat in a uh, there's a rat in a cage and when a light comes on like a certain light comes on if the rat presses a lever he gets food uh he or she uh the rat gets food and if they press the lever at the wrong time when the wrong signal light is on they get a zap um and then there's like different ways to so that's positive reinforcement um there's you know it tracks three types of reinforcement it tracks positive reinforcement which is green light goes on press lever boop you know ah somebody got the reference you know get a get a piece of food um there's negative reinforcement which is not punishment Re negative reinforcement is correct behavior to remove a bad thing so what they would do is they'd run the the electric current on the floor and then the rat would press the lever to turn the current off that's negative reinforcement um, you know, think about any video game where there's like, I always think about Batman Arkham Asylum. There's a level where there's like poison gas filling part of the asylum and Batman has to like solve puzzles and, and do some like movement based platforming stuff to like get to levers and remove the bad condition in the level or like anything where you have to change the level of water in a level. That's like negative reinforcement in video games. And then punishments are like, you know, wrong light is on, you press the lever, you get punished. So, you know, that's um, that's basically what the different types of, you know, again, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, punishment in behavior theory are. Brings me back to psychology, class pain, all that. Yeah, it's operant conditioning. Um, but, but here's the thing. Actually, I'm really excited that you pointed out. It's like psychology class pain. Um, game design is psychology. Uh-oh. <laughs> Ta-da. Um, game design is a little bit of psychology. And, like, this is one of the things in game development that... I think is worth really sitting down and meditating on is that, you know, a lot of people get into it because they like games, but the best game designers are very intellectual with how they make their games. And they're inspired by a lot of areas outside of game design. So if you're looking at, for example, rules of play, um, you know, it, you might have, people who've read it are going to have noticed that Rules of Play is not just full of a bunch of, like, references to, like, Super Mario Brothers is awesome or something like that. Um, there's certainly a lot of, you know, theories of game design, practical, usable theories of game design, but those theories are often rooted in something that is from a field outside of, you know, purely outside of, like, outside of purely games. So there's a lot of psychology in that book. There's a lot of systems theory in that book. Um, so there's stuff from computer science. There's stuff from, um, you know, there's there's literally a chapter on game theory, which you're like, of course there is, it's video games. But game theory is actually a branch of applied mathematics that 
games out, that's why it's called game theory, um, decision-making processes. Now, the thing about this, and this applies totally to this lecture, is that um, most of the th those things that are brought in from other fields in game studies, in game design theory, are like, I don't know, the chapter one, the like stuff from chapter one of a book. Um, and that's okay because that's not like our area of expertise. We are not game theorists. We are game design theorists, but not, you know, mathematicians that practice and, and utilize game theory. Unless you are, and then there's, there's like, you know, remember I talk about the game industry as the house with the locked door, but all the windows are open. There's your in. Uh, you know, I've talked about Chris Hazard a lot um, from Hazardous Software. He has a background in game theory. So he brings in all the other stuff that's not just the cake cutting or the prisoner's dilemma, which is like, again, that simple version of game theory that gets cited in, in the uh, game design stuff. Um, you know, Dr. Dunlap, she is a, she is actually a psychologist. She brings in all of that psychology things, uh, all that psychology stuff. And like, you know, every time a level designer is like, hmm, I should learn about architecture. That seems useful. Hi. Um, you know, for those who don't know, my background's in architecture and I wrote a book about architecture and level design. So, like, that's, that's, that's the beauty of this field, but, you know, you'll realize that all, yeah, somebody says game theory like the prisoner's dilemma. Exactly. Um, so game design is like super intellectual and you've got to learn like a little bit of all these things. Um, so if you know psychology, don't, don't throw it away. It's actually like super useful. You need to know that stuff because, um, you know, again, you're not going to be a psychologist, but as long as you don't butcher it, like you're going to find useful stuff. Um, you know, and, and, <laughs> All the times I've talked about psychology and game design, I actually had somebody come up to one of my talks at a conference one time and be like, hi, I'm a psychologist. And I'm like, oh boy, how did I screw up? And they're like, no, you're pretty good. Read this other book too. That might help. Or like, you know, that might give you some more ideas. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> um, but yeah, like understand this stuff. And, and you're not going to understand everything, but anything you can bring to it, um, that is outside of games. So that's why I'm, I'm always like trying to, um, recommend stuff to you because if you can understand all this, you know, some of this other stuff, you're going to be just that much better at this. Um, you know, understanding all of these things, game theory, psychology, architecture, art, animation, um, acting, theater, uh, that, all that's all going to give you something to chew on um in your in your game design and it'll make you be able to make better games um so you specifically see this type of gameplay the going back to behavior theory um <clears throat> you see it in games like farmville tiny tower i need to update the mobile game references to this but like babies basically like the <clears throat> the uh, predominant i would say design trends in mobile games are behavior theory and people have called like Skinner box my theater performance minors time to shine yeah yeah I, I mean like we've we have students in this program that took a few semesters in like fashion design and like came to our program instead haha <laughs> um now the fashion people are super cool they are um but like that's their theory thing right you know their their models and designs are they've got this like flair to them that that it just adds like you know a different take and i'm like well there you go there's there's your thing what can you do with that and like emphasize that sort of that element of your design um, you know, with, with what you have coming from like costume design. So maybe that's like your creative, um, addition to, to what you do. Like if somebody has like a graphic design background, 
um, you know, and you're getting into like UI art or something like that or marketing, um, there's there's all these things you can do uh, with having some other ingredient to throw in the mix. Um, you know, this is why like Tim Schafer, who founded Double Fine, why he can make all the games that he's made. He studied folklore in college. You know, this is like way before there was game design schools. He has a background in folklore. So, you know, making Grim Fandango, which is a really, it's like one of the greatest adventure games of all time based on, um, you know, Mexican, uh, you know, symbolism and, and mythology and things like that is totally in his wheelhouse because, you know, he has that background, but because not many people have that background, hey, how, how unique is a game like that? Um, so, you know, these are all the, I mean, heck, that's what Will Wright does. You know, he reads a book about city planning, makes him city. Uh, this is the reason Nintendo stopped, uh, told Shigeru Miyamoto to stop talking about his hobbies because every, like, if he says, um, you know, I'm taking up gardening, everybody's going to start throwing out gardening games. Um, by the way, his gardening thing, uh, turned into Pikmin, his gardening hobby turned into Pikmin. So, you know, that's, that's how games work. Um, or that's how getting inspiration from outside of games works. Um, so yeah, Skinner boxes are, you know, a lot of mobile game type things. And in your optional textbook, Resonant Games, which is available in full at the shown web address, um, it's also in your syllabus, the authors talk about how they avoided gamification in the chapter Games Not Gamification. In one of their games, uh, Lure of the Labyrinth, it has elements of gamification, but through several particularly playful and interactive ideas, it, in full, it in avoids being a full gamification program. So, and, and this is something that is important. You know, games have reward systems. That's okay. And in our case, reward systems can be useful for increasing player motivation if that indeed increases player motivation. The question really becomes... Is it the entire picture of your thing? Or is there other stuff that gamification is, like, folded into? Um, you know, and, like, again, all games have reward systems. People love role-playing games. There's a reason people are still buying Skyrim. You know, and it's been, like, nine years re-released on everything. Um, you know, that it has a role-playing game system of rewards and points and levels but it's it's that's far from the entire package right so you know the authors of this book uh highlight examples specifically they added the ability for players to customize their own avatars and explore new identities um they talked about the way that the game scales over time and becomes more complex as players reach later levels so it's not that there is a reward system that takes you to later levels it's that the challenge also scales with the game. So like maybe the challenge ramps up and you're asked to do more stuff at each level. So there's game design happening with, <clears throat> you know, how the game becomes more difficult or more involved as you level up. It's not just like you keep leveling up for the same small task that never gets harder. So that's a game progression thing and it doesn't take a long time to implement the idea of, well, of course you're going to fight harder enemies, but a lot of gamification systems are even missing that. Um, you know, and again, that's that's something in tra uh, traditional commercial games. It's like I talk about with my metaphor of game design school as a Japanese role-playing game. You're going to start level one hitting slimes, and then you're going to stay away from like the, cre the wizard that's over there, you're like, no, 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 I'm still level one, I'm gonna bash some slimes, Mr. Wizard, and then at level three, then you can go fight the wizard, which is, you know, making a more complex 3D model or something. And then after you've beaten a bunch of wizards, then you've leveled up, and then you can tackle animated characters or um, integrating Montessori method into your game design document or you know, in something like that. Um, but you, you build up and you scale your tasks along with your level of experience and knowledge. Um, 
again, game, pure gamification does not have that. It's just like you will always be fighting slimes. Um, and then the way the game leads foundation for later learning in the topic area rather than being self-contained. That's super important. Your game's mission is not to fix every problem. It's usually like a step on a journey. So that's, again, a major part of this type of game design. Uh, another game they describe is a science game for middle schoolers called Vanished. According to the authors, Vanished avoids gamification in several ways, such as giving players choices of how to approach the game, designing the game to emphasize social connections between players. Um, Terraria does progression tiers the best. There's no set level. You have uh, only better gear and what? Yeah, that's... that's um, so the idea of like you know, increasing gear and weapons is a night. It, it's a model. I wouldn't say it's the best model. And I'm not, I'm saying that less because I don't like the model and more because I'm, I'm hesitant to apply judgment. Like that's a very, saying something is the best is very opinion driven. Um, but that is another really good progression system that offers like really clear external feedback to the player. So the, the feedback system described is like, you don't have a level as a character, um, but your character increases, uh, you get access to better gear at different, over time, rather than, you know, your character increasing. Um, Undertale does a similar thing to if you play on Pacifist where your character never gets stronger themselves, but you have access to better um, weapons and armor throughout as well. That's more story-driven, less achievement-driven, like Terraria, which is more of an open system. But again, that's an alternate take you can use, um, which I think, like, again, if it fits your the, the system you're trying to build, actually can be a nice... Um, you know, reference to have in your back pocket. This is why you play lots of games, so you know these systems, right? That they, they're not, um, you don't just have, like, a limited set of systems. That's the problem with, like, people who get into serious games that don't play games at all, or don't, like, when they make the switch to play serious games, they still fight the idea of playing video games or games in general, is that they don't have, they don't have precedence to work from. So the idea of having, like, playing Terraria and then saying, oh, here's a level system that's alternate from levels is is great. Yes. Um, it's perfect. Uh, so designing the game to emphasize social connections between players, that's a big thing you see in a lot of tabletop games especially. Uh, and then also just having, like, a story and a world. Um, having in-game tasks that are uh, like playful and reflective of the problem being solved. Those are things that, again, that's the stuff that you people get into game design who love games are really jonesing to do is like build their story with their world. Um, put that in your serious game. You can make amazing things that are better than, you know, Skinner boxes. So it's just looking at these two examples, we can see how these principles map to different types of psychology uh, that we studied. Uh, there are rewards, but there are also opportunities to interact freely with the game elements in Montessori-style open play. The game also features scaffolding challenges and multiple paths through the experience, which is constructivism. Um, oh no, that's still Montessori. Constructivist learning is repetition um, through social constructivism, by the way. Uh, so social constructivism is where a group of people all interacting with the same problem build a shared body of knowledge. So, for example, if we were all working for one client in our class, and I've run serious games classes like that where you're all making the same game. Let's say the client, let's say we could interact in person and the client came in for a review and we did like every group presented to the client, but then had to watch the other, you know, like what they're doing over in the architecture school, basically, um, in a typical, uh, you know, project review. Um, 
And what would happen is that the client might say something to a group, oh, we thought that we'd have something more like that instead of this. Well, here's, here's the trick. By saying that in a public way, the client has, you know, the mistake is when a group is not paying attention and they don't hear it. So that bit of information about what the client wants from the project is given to one group, you know. But ideally, what you're doing all by presenting your different solutions to the client and getting their feedback is if everybody's listening to the feedback, and the way I'm describing this, it sounds like spying. This is just how presentations work uh, when you are working with clients, is that if you're trying to you know, make stuff for the client by seeing them react to different solutions. And this is why, like, if you just had a client and you were one company working with one client, you'd have multiple proposals for them, maybe, uh, or, you know, multiple pieces of concept art or whatever. Um, you give the client choices because as they review a choice that may not even be the final choice, you're still going to learn things about what they want. And then, you know, again, if we're doing that in a group setting, them saying, oh, we want the character to be blue, then like all of the groups should make their character blue. Now you've just learned something that wouldn't have necessarily been in the original design brief that the character should be blue. Um, but those are the things like you are building the group's common knowledge of this. This is why it kills me that we can't like be in person. Um, you know... Like, for example, if we were all in person, we could have a playtest session. And then you can see like, oh, everybody keeps falling into this design trap. So let's talk about the design trap. And then we all learn something about better design or something like that. Because you've all, you know, done something in your game that, you know, you could all improve in this one specific way. Or you've all found an element that is really good. And so everybody should put it in their game. You know, that's that's. That's what group, uh, that's what social constructivism thing is, is, like a group of people make a shared body of knowledge. Um, so as, as students play a game, you know, you can have this happen in a game because if students in a group play a game, they are all building knowledge instead of just like, again, one person building knowledge, playing a single player. Um, in a way, these principles also map to the question of intrinsic or extrinsic motivation in education. Is someone doing a task because they want to, because they want to, or because they're ex uh, rewarded externally? And this gets into the whole like, you know, this is why grades are dumb, um, but like we have to have them. Um, you know, the idea is that. Like, you should be intrinsically motivated to do this. But we have this system that emphasizes extrinsic motivation. So this is why I've tried to pull back with my grading system of being like, you know, look, do the thing, but try to practice. Um, it's always broken down when somebody just kind of is like, let me check it off my checklist and shove out whatever. Um, but, you know, the idea is that, like, we want you to explore. We want you to, to experiment. Um, so hopefully, <clears throat> you know, you're able to take some time to do that. I know this semester is like screwed up, but, um, you know, don't forget to do that. Because uh, that is that intrinsic motivation of like bettering yourself versus, vers uh, versus just like, again, trying to get a, a letter, like a letter grade. So, you know, it's the same thing in your game. Is the person intrinsically motivated to explore the game and thus explore the content or are they playing the game because like it feels good to get hats or something um and there's again places for both but you can add intrinsic motivation in addition to extrinsic motivation um <clears throat> a game studies concept related to these principles of that is that of possibility space which describes how many unforeseen interactions can happen within the system of a game. So one way to increase your game's possibility space is with more mechanics, but another way to accomplish it is to have your, your mechanics in your game offer lots of different ways to use them. 
in the case with a character builder with lots of different combinations. So if you have a character builder and you make lots of like hats, you know, in the character builder, then there's more potential combinations. And then those <clears throat> potential combinations will bring the players back to always like experiment with more combinations. Um, or like open-ended storytelling. Open-ended storytelling, like in a role-playing game, is versus like, you know, if you choose to be good or evil, what happens? Uh, branching pathways. It's more engaging. There's more openness. There's a bigger possibility space. Players will be more intrinsically motivated. Um, and some of these things are not that hard to do. Like, if you design a role-playing game that's a transformational game, but it's a tabletop and the players can, like, define their own story, infinite possibility space. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, that's a really important part of motivation. Behavior theory-centric games and gamification systems have teeny tiny possibility spaces because it's like, do thing, get widget, do thing, get widget, do thing, get widget. No, that's no possibility. Let me know if anybody had any questions. I'm starting to get kind of academic here, but you can see how they work in. I I want you to see how they work in a actual production, if that makes sense. I'm going to try to blow through this. Um, to avoid the chocolate covered broccoli issue of gamification, we have the exploratory positive psychology of Montessori and constructive learning, but we also have systems that build intrinsic motivation um, and you know, we try to have a large possibility space. When we find game mechanics or other design combinations that help us solidify these areas, how do we remember them for future projects? That's where we talk about patterns. So the idea of design patterns comes from architect Christopher Alexander who in 1977 published a book of design where he created several hundred repeatable design ideas that could be used anywhere. These patterns were based on human psychology and how people reacted to the built environment around them. Uh, this book was one of Will Wright's inspirations for The Sims and SimCity. And it said that, oops, it said that if you use patterns from the books, your Sim characters are actually happier. So what does this mean for game design? Uh, the idea of patterns caught on in other fields, such as uh, computer science, uh, and the idea of having a system of predetermined parts that could be mixed and matched was very influential. Several efforts to make design pattern languages for game design have existed, but for our purposes, I'm going to work with, um, I'm going to highlight the work of a friend of mine, Chris Barney, um, who teaches at Northeastern University. So Chris's look at Ad Alexander uh, Alexander's patterns goes beyond trying to find a system of repeatable parts, but looks at the core of the patterns, which is, as Alexander described, um, answers to problems that occur over and over again in our environment. So basically, if when you are making a game, you see a problem happening over and over again, I'm not talking about a bug or a glitch, I'm talking about like, what we found this particular level layout to be really good at, you know, teaching, like, okay, for function force, we used situations where um, we observed that in many video games, if the player is forced into a situation where they have to interact with something uh, for the first time, they pick up pretty easily what that interactive thing does and they learn how to use it so we made levels uh, parts of levels that forced you to interact with um you know things in the game so for example like we'd have you shoot some enemies with the laser and the laser would you you know wouldn't have changed the mathematical equation of your laser yet um so it would shoot straight ahead and then if you had to interact with an icon that increased the x value, uh, thus the slope of the line, because remember function forces the game where the laser is the mathematical graph, if you have to increase the slope, uh, do the thing that increases the slope of the laser, and then shoot more enemies, 
you suddenly realize, wait, my laser has changed and now I have to deal with this new reality, but I can see that these icons change my laser in these ways. And then we have you apply that knowledge by making you solve a actual math problem with, you know, by having like open access to the, la the, the plus and minus icons. Then you have to like apply what you've discovered. So that was a pattern, the idea of like, forced participation in a system might be called a pattern <clears throat> to teach to teach learning so rather than de developing a language himself chris has developed a system through which designers can develop their own pattern languages for their games i'm not going to go through them um simply because we're like at the end of the the lesson but it is actually part of a book that's coming out like later this year um so if you, but if you do take any mo, uh, most any design talk at a conference like GDC, especially where those where someone describes how they made a thing in their game, it'll generally be of the format. While we were making our game, we noticed that X was a problem, so we used Y solution to solve it. The Y is the solution, like it's a design pattern. So it's like, oh, every time that, you know. Every time we wanted to entice the player to explore something, we had it uh, peek out from behind a mountain. That's Breath of the Wild. Like, everything was is triangle-shaped stuff in Breath of the Wild. So triangle-shaped like things like mountains and, you know, the way architecture is done and things like that, that's a design pattern that Nintendo used to build the world of Breath of the Wild. Burr, burr, burr. And um, I can cover these later. I'm, I'm just going to blow through. Uh, and then real quick, so pattern languages brings us to an educational game uh, where I use this pattern as the core of the playable elements, La Mancha. It's a storytelling card game for three to five players where each player takes the role of a knight, similar to the literary character of Don Quixote. And if you're unfamiliar with Don Quixote, He's the title character of a 1605 novel of, a, of the same name by Spanish author uh, Miguel de Cervantes. Don Quixote is an old man who reads too many books about knights and chivalry and decides that he too wants to travel the world saving the oppressed. Uh, this, of course, is an era where knights and chivalry are long got, forgotten concepts and are seen as more mythical. To give you an idea of a modern equivalent, it's like, if you, if in our quarantined world, you binged watched the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe, but then thought you were Captain America, and then started punching mailboxes um, because you thought they were all Thanos, um, you would, you'd be like a modern day Don Quixote because you're like, I'm trying to um, overcome the tyranny of modern society actually that works way too well um so you know the way the game works is that so the reason that we study this game or this book is that it is um among the classics of modern literature um modern meaning like you know modernity uh, people have called it the first modern novel because it focuses on the development of its characters rather than a series just of, like, feats, uh, like a chivalry novel would. Um, I don't know why Siri turned on. That's weird. Um, you know, it's, it's an important piece of world literature, and thus people study it. So I wanted to make a game where people could, by playing the game, study Don Quixote. So people playing La Mancha have a hand of chivalry cards with quotes from Book of Chivalry on them. Uh, let me open it up and show you those. So chivalry cards, and they have quotes from Books of Chivalry on them. Um, they respond to a story prompt, which is usually a scene from Don Quixote itself. Uh, boo, 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 boo. So you might have something like this. This is actually not a storytelling prompt card. Um, you know this and you know they they have uh, situations from the novel and then um, by using their but what they do is you know you have a premise of a story 
and you have cards with phrases on them, kind of like you know if you've played Apples to Apples or or uh, Cards Against Humanity, um, you respond with a card with a phrase on it. It, but instead of just being like a you know a punchline, where in Cards Against Humanity it's just like what answers like answer a question and then the reading of the card is the point. Here, what you do is you take the card, play it, and it be the phrase becomes the basis of a story you tell. And so you build a story around your card answer. And that becomes, again, a sort of open-ended um, engagement with the plot and the elements of the novel, but also this idea of like sh actual chivalric text. So by using cards to invent new outcomes to situations in the novel and form story arcs for their characters, so we've had people say like, you know, they woo a character and then the character appears in their story from then on. Um, players learn about the great piece of literature because they are uh, reinventing it, they are engaging with it, they are living in the world of Don Quixote and learning it kinesthetically rather than, again, this being like the, this could have been gamified Don Quixote quiz, and I've I've reviewed for competition serious games that are just quiz games, and like that's not game design or it's game design. It's not good game design. You want to have something where people can like live and engage and puzzle out the the um, the thing your game is about. And then real quick, um, you know, a gamified version of this where you read the novel and then checked in where you reach specific chapters, or um, you'd a answer questions about the, you know, about the novel for like reading comprehension badges, and that, that sucks. Um, you know, while the game lets you create outcomes that are alternative to the text, it lets you inhabit and explore the novel's world. I already talked about that. Um, it's the same thing as that game I've talked about before, Diplomacy, which is a strategy game. You know, it shows pre-World War I history, and again, at no point do you say, okay, let's recreate this exact thing. You are more like, I'm Germany and I'm enacting the, like, I'm in the same political situation as Germany because of, like, my abilities and my geographic location that I have. So I need to act, I'm going to do what Germany might do, you know, and then, but you maybe make a different alliance than you, than actually happened, but you are understanding, like, the geopolitical situation Germany was in. So, you know, um, or France or England or, you know, whoever. So that's how games do this, is they create the system of the world they are about um, or how good educational games do it. And then they, like, let the players live that. And then you kind of, like, check in after when you're like, well, what did you think? Um, again, same thing happens in Oregon Trail or Depression Quest or... Um, Ian Bogus win game, um, you know, so you too can know about wind. Uh, you know, any game, any of these games, that's all these games are about. So, um, that's it. Any questions? Uh, that's old. That's old. Okay. Anyway, any questions? Thank you for... I can, um, if anybody does want to see that design pattern stuff, I can probably put the slides up on Blackboard or on Discord. That's what I meant to say. Uh, let me save this as a PDF. I really should do this with everything, but, um, yes, speaker notes. Um, but yeah, well, especially since this one gets a little academic, um, so, but yeah, um, I don't know. Any other questions? Finally reaching the bottom dregs of the coffee.
Well, I'm around. Um, if there are any questions, happy to answer. Um, but I will, I will see you all later. Remember Wednesday around class time uh, in Blackboard uh, in Collaborate Altar, we are having our guest speaker. Um, I'll let you know if that changes because I need to um, confirm with her. But you know, that's uh, she's awesome. She's awesome game developer. So um, you know, I hope hope you join. Um, other than that, have a good day, be safe, be well, um, and I will talk to you later.